Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come before you today. We're praying that the Bible will be an open book to every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that in all the things that we read, you'll teach us valuable lessons for our own lives, that will teach us things that are practical, things that we need to be successful in the Christian work that we have committed into our hands. And we pray that in all circumstances and situations, the things we learn from your word will make us to be able to go through without any setbacks anytime in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our understanding today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We come to a very important experience in the time and in the life of Paul the Apostle, together with the other people that traveled along with him in the missionary journey. If you have been following the events very well, in the 16th chapter of Acts of the Apostles, Paul and Silas entered into Derby and Lystra, and Timothy was seen as a very serious and zealous and devoted Christian believer. And he was recommended by the people in Lystra and Iconium. As led by the Spirit of God, Paul chose him. Though he was young, because Paul referred to him later as my son Timothy, yet he, fit, he fitted perfectly into the group or into the team. And I told you last week that as we see the flow of the narrative, we see the use of the word we and the word us. And we know that Luke is a writer of the Acts of the Apostles. That means in this chapter also, somewhere along the line, that Luke joined the team. So you have at least four people, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. But from the flow of the story and from the things that happened that we're going to read today, it appeared that Paul was the chief speaker and Silas was also a notable, prominent speaker in the team. It appears that Timothy just had a supporting ministry and Luke just had a supporting ministry. Now you have seen the call to Macedonia as a man stood in the night vision before Paul, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Waking up in the morning, he related the vision of the revelation to the team. And the team understood from what Paul said, that God was calling them to go into Macedonia. And immediately, without wasting time, they endeavored to go into Macedonia. Getting away from Troas, they got into a number of cities. Eventually, they came to Philippi. It was at Philippi that they saw a group of women were meeting together and they preached the gospel as they had opportunity. Among these women, we read of Lydia, a notable rich woman, a seller of purple, worshipping the Lord with all her heart. The Lord touched her concerning the gospel that Paul preached. She gave her life to the Lord. She was baptized in water as well as a household because they yielded to the Lord. But then there was a maid, a lady, a woman, that followed Paul and the team and was all the time saying, shouting after them, these are the servants of the Most High God which show unto us the way of salvation. We studied last week that Paul did not immediately act. Paul did not immediately give a word of command. Because spiritual power is not something that you turn off and turn on at will, whenever you like, the way you want. But he waited until the Spirit moved him. You'll find in the whole Bible as you find the people that were filled of the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit, that they did certain things that brought miraculous effects as a result of waiting for the time of the Spirit. And Paul waited for the appropriate time when the greatest crowd had gathered 
and then he commanded that evil spirit to come out the evil spirit came out as a result of the evil spirit coming out the lady was delivered the lady lost her power and she couldn't get into divination or soothsaying or fortune telling anymore she lost her profession of deceit she couldn't deceive people anymore to see visions for them to predict things for them and the business collapsed because of this the masters the people that were using her for the profession they became angry and they told lies on paul and silas so they had to drag paul and silas to the magistrates in the marketplace and they convinced the multitudes that these were evil doers they were gospel preachers but the multitude mist uh, mistakenly took them for evil doers because of the lies of those masters of the soothsayer because of this they were thrown into the prison in the prison facing this persecution they reacted in a proper way in the way you ought to act in the way i ought to react whenever there is opposition criticism or persecution as a result of the right response in the dangerous or difficult circumstance a great miracle took place as a result of that miracle the keeper of that prison became inquisitive as to the authority the power behind these two men and he asked about the way of the lord he was told in a very simple way he yielded his life to the lord he became saved his household was also saved by the very second day the following morning these two men silas and paul were taken out of the prison and they came back to the saints in the town at philippi rejoicing with them comforting them and encouraging them that in short is the story the account of what we're studying today but i've just summarized it for you there is so much we have to learn as christians as workers as ministers as soul winners and evangelists as people that have the call of god upon our lives there is a lot we need to learn now let's see from the flow of the narrative from the flow of the story what the lord wants to teach us the story can be divided into four parts saints suffering persecution in prison supernatural signs through prayer and praise sincere search by the philippian prison official and then security and salvation security and deliverance of persecuted preachers let's read verses 19 to 24 acts chapter 16 and when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone they caught paul and silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying these men being jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive neither to observe being romans and the multitude rose up together against them and the magistrates rent off their clothes they tore their clothes and commanded to beat them and when they had laid many stripes upon them they were they cast them into prison charging the jailer to keep them safely who having received such a charge such a commandment thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stalks Paul the apostle had given a word of command a word of authority a word of power and he had performed great miracles as a result of manifestation of the spirit or the gifts of the spirit and he commanded that evil spirit to come out from that woman now many people want to find out how do we manifest the power of god and they want to know why do so few people experience the authority in the name of jesus and they experience the power of the holy ghost why is it we don't have too many people like moses who is able to give a word of command and 
all circumstances will just stream, be streamlined according to the word of his command why don't we have more people like joshua why don't we have more people like elijah like elisha why don't we have more people like peter and like paul the consequence of manifesting the power of god is great manifesting the power of god may make you popular among the saints of god may make you popular among the people that love god but at the same time it may expose you to persecution among the people that are not sincere among sinners and if you take the lives of uh, the great men of the bible days if you take them one by one manifesting the power of god cost them a lot in their lives think about moses he, may, he might have been popular among the children of Israel, but obviously he wasn't popular before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was threatening him, you will not see my face anymore. He wasn't popular among um, the people that he went against, that his power worked against. You'll know that Balak didn't like the children of Israel at all. If they could get rid of Moses, they would easily, joyfully have done that. And you'll see the same way with Joshua. His power might have made him popular among the children of Israel because they were rejoicing while the Jericho walls were coming down, while the victories were being won on every battlefield. But then among the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites, among the enemies of the people of God, Joshua was not popular at all. Take Elijah. Elijah might have been loved by people that recognize the power of God people that appreciate the power of God but you know Ahab did not like him at all Ahab said you are the one that is troubling Israel and if Ahab could have done anything against him he would have killed him in fact you know that Jezebel wanted to get rid of Elijah and the same thing with Elisha the same thing with all the men of God that had manifested the power of God and so whenever you say that you are seeking the power of God whenever you say Lord grant me power grant me more authority grant me the manifestation of the authority in the name of jesus christ count the cost count the cost because they're going to criticize you for it they're going to slander you for it they're going to oppose you for it they're going to even plan on perhaps even destroying your life for manifesting the power of God because as it is delivering some it will be destroying the businesses the crooked dubious businesses of some other people you know the Lord Jesus Christ he manifested power and the people that were healed the people that received miracles they loved him but then the people whose pigs drowned in the water the people who lost their religious business, they didn't like him. And they, got, they wanted to get rid of him. That's the cost, that's the price we pay for having the power of God. As I've told you, it may make you popular among the saints. But then at the same time, it may make you persecuted among the sinners. Now, as the evil spirit was cast out of this lady, the masters saw that the profession was off the possibility of their gain was gone and because of that they influenced the multitudes and the magistrates and he told lights on them and he said these men being Jews they are troubling our city and he said the teaching customs which are not lawful for us to receive neither observe being Romans they didn't say they were angry because evil spirit had been cast out of the child, of the maid. You see, sinners will not tell the truth. Sinners will not give the actual reason why they are persecuting the believers or the preachers. But they will find an excuse. An, ex an excuse that will seem acceptable to the multitude. And the multitude is always unreasonable. The multitude in verse 22 rose up against them. And the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. You know why the magistrates acted like that? It was a Roman law that no Roman must be forced to take another religion, another custom. And they protected the, their religion, the national religion, worshipping um, the emperor, as they protected the citizens. 
and they protected that religion with law, with a national policy. And when these people brought the charge against the apostle Paul and uh, the preacher Silas, that these men are telling us, they are commanding us, they are confusing us with another religion, then they commanded Paul and Silas to be beaten. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, many stripes upon them, it doesn't say 39, many stripes. For the Jews, they had a law that they will not uh, give somebody 40 stripes, but it will be 40 save one. 40 but 1 40 minus 1 but in this case they were operating not under a Jewish law they were operating under a Roman law and in the Roman law there was no stipulation of how many times uh, how many stripes they will be given in fact Paul the apostle himself said stripes above measure in 2nd Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In stripes, they lost count. In stripes, because they were operating under the Roman law, it was just beyond measure. In prisons more frequent, in deaths often. And so these apostles were beaten. Now let's remind ourselves that Jesus Christ said, we will be persecuted. But then let us understand that whenever we are persecuted, we must not be persecuted because of being sinners. Let it be on the basis of doing the will of God, on the basis of being righteous. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and the spirit of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Now we Christians may suffer persecution, but then let it not be the punishment of our own sins, our own misdeeds. Now if you suffer as an evildoer, as a liar, as a deceiver, as a thief, as a fornicator, if you suffer as an adulterer, if you suffer as a busybody, um, getting into other people's matters you are not suffering as a Christian you are suffering as an evil doer and in the case of suffering as an evil doer you will not be able to have confidence to pray for miraculous deliverance because you know that you are suffering as a result of your sin yet if any man suffer as a Christian let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in this behalf in first peter chapter 3 first peter chapter 3 from verse 14 but and if ye suffer for righteousness say happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled but sanctify the lord god in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as, an, as evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accused your good conversation in Christ, for it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. Matthew chapter 5, from verse 10. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, not for immorality's sake, not for being a busybody, not for being a thief, not for being a robber. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are ye when men shall revile you. That means ridicule you, make jest of you, reproach you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now what are we told to do when we're persecuted? Verse 12, rejoice and be exceeding glad. If you say you are saved, show the evidence of that salvation when you are persecuted, rejoice and be exceeding glad. If you say that you are sanctified, then behave well, act right when you are reproached, when you are ridiculed, when you are criticized, when you are persecuted. When you, are, when you are lied against, when you are slandered, when you are beaten for righteousness sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That's how we know those who are really saved. Those who are really saved, they don't give up when they are persecuted. They don't backslide when they are persecuted. They don't stop reading their Bibles when they are persecuted. They don't stop praying and praising the Lord when they are persecuted. They don't stop coming to fellowship when they are persecuted. They rejoice and are exceedingly glad because they know that theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, what did Paul do? What did Silas do when these two people were persecuted, when they were beat, beaten and thrown into the prison? Let's see. From Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. From verse 25. And at midnight... Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaking, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. Let's stop there. Now today we see that many people experience persecution, but too many people experience miraculous deliverances, signs and wonders during persecution. Now, if you have been a Christian for some time, you will know that it's unfortunate that many times our prayer lives depend on how we feel. When we feel right, we pray well. When we feel not all right, we don't pray well. When we feel happy, we pray well. When we feel unhappy, we don't pray so well. When people criticize us, we forget the promises of God, we remember the problems. And therefore our prayers are not as powerful, as effectual, as fervent as when there was no problem. You know that when we're separated and isolated from the fellow believers, from the brethren, we don't pray so well. Because we think now we're missing fellowship. We think now these people are persecuting us. We think now these people are telling lies against us. And we feel these people, the multitude, they'll think that I'm a criminal. And yet I am saved, I'm sanctified, I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. We dwell in self-pity. And you know when we have self-pity, we don't pray well. But uh, when we're happy, when we're among the believers, other believers, and other people are praising us, and they're saying, oh, you've done well, and they're giving us commendation and praises, we pray well. But, and you know that when, you know, the light has gone in the house, and you knock your, you knock your leg on the stool, or on the chair, and, uh, you know, you, you turn the table upside down, then you pour the water down, or you, your plate of food falls down, and then everything is broken. After that, you don't pray well, because your prayer depends upon your feeling. But when the light has come, when everything is all right, when your, when your wife is smiling, when your mates are working well, when you've got promotion, when you've got everything going right, when you come to church and the message is fine and the message is wonderful, then you pray well. You know, my brothers and sisters, that's why we don't receive more miracles. Because we need to learn the secret here. It's very, it's very easy for you to get into spiritual power if you will just make up your mind, you're not going to live by your feelings. You know, they're beating Paul and Silas. Their backs were bleeding. You say, how do we know that? Because when the Philippian jailer got converted later, he washed their wounds. The wounds, they were bleeding. Their feet were in the stalks. They were tied to the stalks and they couldn't move and there was no light in that place. And you know, inside that uh, persecution, they began to pray. 
and it says in verse 25 and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed you know the secret of answered prayer to live on top of your problems while you are praying to just momentarily temporarily forget that there was any problem at all and pray unto God and don't let your feeling interfere with your faith don't let your problems interfere with your prayer don't let your surrounding your circumstances limit the Savior in your sight just continue to pray to the Lord and know that there is a straight channel towards God even though the problems are there forget them neglect them even though the pains are in your body don't even think about the pains in your body you know what limits our prayer for healing you know what limits our prayer for miracle because you know while we're praying we're feeling the pain in our body the problem in our family the problems in our place of work and uh, we're feeling the injury we're feeling the persecution and we're praying with one mind and we're thinking of the problems with another mind you know a prayer like that is not going to have the same type of answer as Paul's and Silas prayer at they forgot the pains they forgot the problems they lived on top of their sorrows and then they sang praises unto God you know the average believer will say what will I sing about what's God looking at you see if you have the wrong attitude you, you limit your prayer power if you have the wrong attitude you destroy your faith because let's understand it brothers and sisters God is God God is always on the throne when you are in the prison God is on the throne when you're on the stormy sea God is on the throne when you are happy God is on the throne when you are sad God is still on the throne you're going to prison does not imprison God your being on the stormy sea does not make uh, the, the power of God to waver or to change in whatever condition you are in whatever circumstances you may be the Lord's power remains the same the Lord's promises remain the same and the Lord's interest in you remain the same and therefore because of that because they knew that there was no change in God and God's power was still there therefore they prayed and they sang praises unto God I don't know what they sang but maybe they were singing I don't know what choruses they sang at, at, in those days I only know the ones we sing today well maybe they sang something similar to I'm not alone the Lord is with me maybe they sang that uh, God is always present with us maybe they sang that at all times rejoice in the Lord I say unto you rejoice maybe they sang that uh, in the morning the light will break it may be dark in the night but in the morning the light will break forth maybe they sang that the Lord will never forget them the Lord will never leave them maybe they sang that the God of yesterday is the God of today and as he delivered saints of old he's going to deliver us today I don't know what they sang the important thing is for you to have a song in the night to have words of praise during the problem and to know that God is still on the throne even though you are going through a problem and not to grumble not to complain not to cry not to lose your faith and not to depend upon your feeling but just to know that you are going to separate your faith from your feeling your prayers from your problems at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them now listen to me there are times we send missionaries out that is um, temporary missionaries we tell them to distribute literature we tell them to go to this country they may not know anybody there at all we just put tracts in their hand literature in their hand cassettes in their hands and we tell them just go to that country and distribute the literature tell them about what God is doing in Nigeria here get them interested so that uh, they will be able to call us to come and preach the gospel to them later now if you want to experience miracles on such a trip you know you understand that at the airport here the problems may start because if you've never traveled before probably you forgot that um, you have some load you didn't take uh, enough money and therefore they even told you that you couldn't carry all your load you dropped some and you began to think now my pairs of, my pairs of shoes in that bag that I dropped the rice 
tomato, tomato pep that my wife gave me to manage as I'm going. Uh, they fried meat, they dropped it. They wouldn't carry it because of the extra load. And while you are in the plane, you are thinking, you are saying, God, why did you do this to me now? You know, when you get on that missionary field, remember you are going to pray for the sick. Remember that you are going to pray for miracles. And while you are thinking on that, that will hinder your prayers. And then you get in there, and they just at the place at the immigration, they are checking you and you say, Oh no, you are not going to enter into this country. You don't have uh, the proper visa. You say, What? I'm a missionary. I came from Deeper Life. Deeper Life is a wonderful church. They said, Deeper what? They've never had anything like that before. And uh, they said they stayed there and they checked all the other passengers. And uh, you are saying, God, where are you now? What have I done? Did I make a mistake? Or was it because you didn't want me to come? You know what you are doing? You are depending upon your circumstances and upon your feelings. And eventually they say, okay, we give you only three days. Three days? What am I going to do in three days? All these tracts and literature I brought to this country is going to take me three weeks before I distribute everything. Then you check up into uh, a restaurant to sleep overnight because you didn't know anybody. And uh, you only have $50 with you. And uh, you say, how much do I pay per night? They said, $70. <laughs> you say, I only have $50. Oh, we're sorry then. Where am I going to sleep? If you're a lady, you begin to cry. If you are a man, you say, where is the toilet where I can cry secretly? But you know, in, in such a case, there will be no miracle. But you know, as you, as you for, at the two part of your load down here, as they trouble you at the immigration over there, you begin to sing praises unto the Lord. A miracle will happen to you. You forget your feeling, you forget your problem. You just forget the circumstances. You think about heaven. You think about God. You think about the promises of God. You think about a God that can never fail. You think about the angels of God. You think about the happy day when God will give you a miracle. You think of the report you are going to give when you come back to Nigeria here to the church. And you think of the wonderful things that you are going to experience on that trip. A miracle will be following you every day. You know, sometimes um, we who are... Uh, preachers and we have to have crusade whole crusade here whole crusade there you know sometimes uh, people wonder how, how dare you how could you ever you go to that place to preach and you pray and people experience miracles you know in my younger days in my younger years if I went for a crusade like we're having now and uh, at the beginning of the crusade if we were to start at 6 if we started at 6.20 you know it will bother me it will, it will make me unhappy. It will make me sad because I like if you say we're going to start at 6, I like us to start at 6 o'clock. And if the ushers were not doing well, the loudspeaker is not doing well, and the chorus leader is not singing well, and the choir is not singing well, you know, if it was to be a crusade, I'll, became, I'll become so bothered, so unhappy. I mean, in the past. And when I come in there, I might even forget what I wanted to preach upon. And I might preach all the time I'm preaching. I'll be thinking within my mind, but uh, why did that chorus leader sing like that? But uh, why all this noise and these children running around? Why are all these ushers not uh, taking care of them? These ushers are not as good as our ushers in Lagos. Why are they like this? Now, as you are thinking of that, the time you are to pray, now you'll just pray, pray, and pray. While you are praying, you are thinking, God, uh, we didn't start well today. This was a bad, this a bad crusade. I don't think many, I don't think many miracles will happen. And you are right, many miracles will not happen. But you know, when you're on a crusade like that and they are not singing well, the ushers are not acting right, and all the things are upside down. But you know that that doesn't remove God from the throne. That doesn't decrease the power in the blood of Jesus. That doesn't take away from the authority of the name of Jesus. That does not decrease the power of the Holy Ghost. That, does not, that is not going to hinder the miracle that is going to happen to the blind and to the lame. That is not going to hinder the sinners from coming forward because the Lord is going to save them in spite of the things that are going wrong in the physical. You know, sometimes if, you, if you're in a crusade like that and you're preaching, and while you're preaching, your Bible is open and 
then it begins to rain a little. You know, if you are not careful, you'll become so bothered and you'll say, God, did we miss the time of the crusade? Why did we fix it at the rainy season? Then you'll remember, this is what I was telling these people that planned the crusade, that this is not the best time for this thing. While you are thinking on your circumstances, you'll never be able to pray for a miracle. But you neglect everything. You forget the circumstances. You just rejoice in the Lord and you keep on praying and miraculous things will be happening. You know, it's the same in a house fellowship. Your house fellowship leader and, you know, your husband has just rebuked you, criticized you, and uh, probably even slapped you because he's not a Christian. And he slapped you just 30 minutes to the time of the house fellowship. Or it happened that uh, your, your child uh, was at the kitchen and here you were, you, you had soup on the fire. And then your child just took that soup, burnt herself, and then the soup is all gone. And you are 30 minutes to the house fellowship. And that house fellowship part line that day is to show how we can receive our healing from the Lord. Nobody is going to get healed. Because you come to that house fellowship and uh, you say, God, what have I done? The soup is purged. My child is burnt. My husband is unhappy. And they are criticizing me for my being a Christian. God, what have I done? God, what have I done? And then you are leading that, um, you are leading that house fellowship. Then the visitation worker did not come in time. The person to lead this uh, singing did not come in time. Lord, why is it like this? Just always with me. At home, things are not right. In the fellowship, things are not right. Nobody lost me anywhere. I'm having a lot of problems. How will you pray and have results and answers to your prayers? Forget all that. And live above your circumstances. You know, that's what Paul and Silas did. They forgot everything. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaking. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. A miracle took place. The miracle took place because the people prayed in faith. And they praised the Lord in spite of their feelings. The keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open. He drew out a sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. In spite of the false accusations, in spite of the strife beyond measure, in spite of the imprisonment, in spite of being separated from the brethren, these preachers prayed, they sang, they praised the Lord. That's a challenge for us. That's a lesson for us. That's a great example for us that when we face persecution, ridicule, malicious slander, false accusation, bitter criticism, rejection and opposition from the neighbors and they are saying aha uh -huh, if uh, god is uh, the way you are talking why have you not got married you know that type of opposition from your neighbors if it is like you are saying why have you not got a child if it is like you are saying why have you not got a job you see, when you begin to think about that, you'll not be able to witness effectively. You'll not be able to preach effectively. You'll not be able to pray effectively. You'll not even be able to read the Bible properly. But in spite of all those things, and in spite of temporary separation from the brethren, you should praise the Lord. You should pray to the Lord. And you'll find that a sudden miracle, a sudden supernatural wonder will take place in your life. In the case of Paul and Silas, a supernatural earthquake shook the prison, opened all the doors, and everyone's bands were loosed. God is still answering prayers today. He'll do the same thing today for every one of us, and I believe he'll do the same thing in Jesus' name. Amen. But we must learn, we must learn 
to live above all contrary conditions and negative circumstances. Let's see the sincere search by the Philippian prison official. From verse 13, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, that means their wounds, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now salvation is a very, very important subject. It's a very, very important experience. Now let us notice there that this Philippian jailer, this keeper of the prison, he was already under conviction. As Christian preachers, as Christian workers, we must be diligent in the preaching of the gospel, but then we must be very careful that we're not saying the same thing to everybody. You know, we make the mistake that whenever you want to preach a salvation message to a man, to a woman, to a, to a household, to a family, to a community, or, or the crusade field, we make the mistake of saying the same thing to different categories of people. But if you will notice that in the Bible, there were people that were inquisitive. There were people that were asking, what shall I do to be saved? A ruler came to Jesus Christ and said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know what Jesus said unto him? He said, keep the laws, keep the commandments. And he said, which? And Jesus said, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not defraud, honor thy father, honor thy mother. And he said, all these have been doing since my youth. What like I yet? And Jesus said, if you'll be perfect, if you'll really enter into the eternal life, sell what you have and give to the poor. Then come back and follow me. Then you'll enter into the kingdom of God. You say, does that mean that everybody will have to sell everything that he has? No, not at all. That's exactly the point I'm making. That you don't say the same thing to everybody. His money was his idol. It's not everybody that has the money as his idol. Jesus didn't tell Nicodemus, go and sell all that you have. That wasn't his problem. Jesus did not tell the woman at the well, go and sell all you have. That wasn't her problem. Jesus did not tell the woman that was weeping and wiping off the tears with the air on her head, go and sell all you have. That wasn't her problem. You see, my brother, my sister, we must be sensitive to the moving of the Spirit of God in presenting the salvation message to the people that come. And that man went away sorrowful because his idol was too great for him, he could not draw. You remember in the Acts of the Apostles? That in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, the people said, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized in water and ye shall receive the remission of your sins, the forgiveness of your sins. You see that answer? And yet when the uh, man that was coming from Jerusalem, when he was asking Philip, here is water, what hinders me to be baptized? You know, he did not re repeat the same formula, Repe uh, repent and be baptized. No, he said, if you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, thou mayest. And he said, I believe he was baptized. But you know, in the next chapter, Paul, at that time Saul, told Jesus, spoke and said, but what shall I do? What will thou have me to do? He said, go to Damascus. It will be showing you what you will do. And for three days he was praying. You see the different answers to different people. But at this time, when this Philippian jailer, the keeper of the prison came and said, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And then in verse 32, they speak the word they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. We must be sensitive to the level of people, the circumstances of people, 
the way the Lord has worked in the hearts of people already when we're leading them to the Lord to be saved. Now, there are people that have difficulties, and um, I'm not opposing anyone, and any, everyone is free to, you know, talk whenever you come to the church like this. In fact, you know, if you don't talk, you will not be able to understand things. Jesus asked questions from, uh, sorry, the disciples of Jesus asked questions from Jesus Christ. And it is good to ask questions when you don't understand. But whenever you're asking a question, make sure that the questions you are asking, you are very sincere, you really need an answer. You know, some people come in here and they say, the church is good, the messages are all right, the singing is fantastic, the ushers are dutiful, and your loudspeaker system, it looks like uh, you have trained your technicians very well, but there's one thing. Uh, how will people ever get saved in your church? Then I ask them, what do you mean? Well, we never see them getting saved. I said, you never see them getting saved? What do you mean? Well, we never see them actually kneeling down and praying 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, and praying for salvation. Oh, I'll say, is that what you mean? They do get saved. And we see the changes in their lives when they really get saved. You know, my brother, my sister, there is a passage we're reading. You don't find a place. In fact, you know, it was in the night. And we're told that in this night, when the miracle had happened, that this man just said, what shall I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved and thine house. They spake the word of the Lord unto him. It didn't take him 30 minutes, one hour, one day, five days, one week, seven months, one year to get saved. Because what they told him to do, he could do in a moment of time. They didn't tell him to lie, they didn't tell him to lie down and be rolling on the ground, repenting of his sins, crying because he had been a terrible sinner. They didn't tell him, tell him to kneel down and just begin to cry his heart out because if he didn't cry, his repentance will not be genuine. We're studying Bible. We're studying Bible. And you know, my brother, my sister, if you just see how the greatest apostles were saved, those that followed Jesus Christ and they had their names written in the book of life. Look at Peter. That Peter was at the seaside. He had been laboring, but he caught nothing. And then Jesus said, throw your net there. He said, at thy word I will. He threw down his net and he caught multitude. Then he came to Jesus openly and he said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And Jesus said, don't worry about that. Follow me. From now on you will catch men. He followed the Lord. He was saved immediately. No tears, no wasting of time, just right there. He became saved. And you know the woman that was caught in adultery. Real terrible sin. Obviously she must have been a terrible sinner. And must have been a terrible sinner to the point that she was committing adultery without remembering to even lock the door. And the Pharisees came in there. Those Pharisees themselves, they were, I don't understand what type of... Uh, yeah, because it was in the morning I think they must have been watching for people committing adultery They must have been searching for them with uh, you know, a real diligent search But this woman forgot to lock the door And they just caught the woman And they didn't bring the man I don't know why, I don't understand those people In any case, you can never understand Pharisees They are inconsistent They brought the woman and they said We caught this woman in adultery They wanted to stone her and then Jesus said, He that has no sin, let him first cast the first stone. And then the woman was standing there, no tears, no weeping, no crying, nothing, whatever. But Jesus knew the heart, the repentance in the heart, the conviction in the heart. And you know, at that time, Jesus looked up and said, Where are all those who accuse us? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. She got saved. She got saved. Just right there. You know the woman at the well? That Jesus Christ had been discussing with that woman. Give me water. Why should I give you water? Says so a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. If you know who is asking you to give him water, you'll give him and then he will give you the water of life. 
and you'll drink and you'll never be thirsty again. Give me this water, well, go and call your husband. I have no husband. You have said right because you had five before. The person you are staying with now is not your husband. How do you know? You must be a prophet. Well, the Messiah says, Come in, I that speak to you, I am he. Is that so? She believed immediately and dropped her water pot and went to the city and began to witness. She had become saved. When did she cry? When did she kneel down? When did she roll on the ground? When did she actually get saved? Right there, the moment she believed this is the Messiah. And I believe that you are the Messiah. I believe you are the Savior. That moment, she got, she got saved. And you know, if you go through the Bible, go through the Bible. The one I told you about, about um, the one day, Ethiopian eunuch, coming, just reading the, reading the Bible, the word of God in the chariot. And Philip came and said, do you understand what you are reading? And said, uh, no, I don't understand. How, how can I understand except some man should guide me? And then he picked up that word of God with him. He explained everything to him. And while they were going, he said, now I'm ready to be baptized. And Philip was surprised. Ready to be baptized. Baptism is not just for everybody. It's only if you believe with all your heart and you are a child of God. Oh, yes, but I do. When did you? Well, while you were talking and talking to me on the way, when you got to that point and said, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, there was something within me that said, yes, I believe it. Yes, I believe it. And if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, thou, thou shalt be saved. And he was saved. You see, the New Testament is very simple. The New Testament is very, very clear. If we don't bring our own notions into it, our own ideas into it, Oh, you mean that uh, we don't have to cry before we get saved? You are right. I mean that the blood of Jesus is greater than your tears. I mean that Jesus Christ, the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, is greater than any other thing you can do. It's greater than any other thing you can give to the Lord. All that the Lord is looking for is that you turn away from all your sin. You can turn away from your sin while you are crying, if you want to cry. You can turn away from your sin while you are not crying, while you are just saying, Lord, I know sin is evil. I know sin is very destructive. I know sin will destroy me and ruin me, and I'm making up my mind. You see, repentance is a decision of the heart. And you turn away from your sin and say, right now, I give myself unto the Lord. I believe he died for me on the cross of Calvary. I believe he's my Savior. I believe right now, I do not belong to the devil anymore. I belong to the Lord. And your life will change immediately. And in this passage, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You know, they were saved. Really saved. How do we know they were saved? Verse 33. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. His attitude changed. His emotions changed. His character changed. He had sympathy now. He was a callous, cruel, brutal prison official before. And when they brought these prisoners, when they brought Paul and Silas into the prison, he threw them into the inner prison. And he made their feet to be in the stalks. But now that he was saved, that he was born again, he took them out. And without teaching him about restitution, without teaching him about kindness, without teaching him about love, without teaching him about sympathy, without teaching him about how to help the saints that are suffering, he began to identify with them. He washed their wounds. And he was baptized, see, and all his house. And he said, I know you must be hungry now. Nobody taught him hospitality. That's the change. That's the change. That's the change. The kindness, the compassion, the mercy. The hospitality that came into his heart. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them. And he rejoiced the joy of salvation. He rejoiced. He wasn't afraid that I would lose my Roman citizenship if I identify with these prisoners. He wasn't afraid if the magistrates know about my bringing these people into my house, I may lose my job. The joy of the Lord became his strength. And without thinking it about it at all, he just rejoiced and believed in God with all his house. You see, when you become saved, your life will change. And I want to 
plead with you, walk us in the church, read the Bible a lot. You know, if you are not reading the Bible, you'll bring ideologies from other denominations into the church. And you'll be in your mind. You'll be thinking like the other denominations will be saying, well, those people, how do they ever get saved? How do they ever get saved? Because you might be thinking the way you were saved is the way everybody will get saved. You know the reason you got saved, how you, were, how you got saved? You know the reason you had to weep and you had to cry and you had to spend a long time, seven months, one year, two years, before you got saved? The reason is because the preacher that preached to you probably got saved that way. Have you ever noticed that in our families, the way we fathers walk, dress, talk, in all probability will be the way that our sons will dress, walk, talk. And you know it's the same thing in the Christian fold. You know the reason why our Zona leaders preach how they preach? That they stand in one place, they don't jump here, jump there, go there, go there. They don't, you know, jump out while they preach. You know why? Because that's the way they see me preaching every time. Not because the Bible says if you are preaching, you must never rise up. You must never move to the left, move to the right. No, just because that's the way they see me preaching. And you go to any other deeper life church and watch all the people preaching exactly the same way that I preach. The mistakes I make, they make. The things I do right, they do right. The grammar that I didn't speak well, they don't speak right. Because the things I do, they do. And you know why people, why you were saved the way you were saved? is because the preachers that preached to you, they wept before they got saved. They cried because they, before they got saved. It took them three months or one year or five years before they got saved. That's the reason you are thinking it will take other people a long time before they get saved. But you know, if you just look at the Bible and know that the important thing is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them turn away from their sins and tell them right there that right there they can get saved. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, I've heard testimonies of salvation in this church that they are just too fantastic. And I ask them, how did you get saved? They will say sometimes on Thursday. And you know that Thursday is well packed. And there is no time while we are finishing the first session or the second session. The people are going out and the next people are coming in. And yet these people get saved. And there was somebody that got saved and had to make restitution of 64,000 naira. And he's making the restitution because he really got saved. He didn't cry when he got saved. He didn't roll on the ground when he got saved. And yet he got saved. You know, there's another person that has made more difficult restitutions. And the one I told you now, how did he get saved? Just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and his life changed. Uh, you know, at Ibadan, we just had a crusade at Ibadan. And um, there was somebody there that gave a testimony and said that the healing that happened in his own family, the, the healing was fantastic. The healing was too wonderful. But then this man said that healing is a small thing. But the miracle that happened in his own life, the miracle that it is unbelievable. You know, just at that crusade, we said, we preached the word and we said, now, if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, you come forward, give your life to Jesus Christ. And this man, highly placed, highly placed, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. And he was giving his testimony privately to our pastor at Ibadan. And he said that it's unbelievable that every week for a long, long time, every week he will go and uh, commit immorality with at least three prostitutes every week and then he will drink he will smoke he'll do a lot of things and that the wife even knew about the morality because it was a regular permanent defiling sin but there's nothing the wife could do because it was a family trouble and yet he gave his life to the Lord just right there within a few minutes and since that time he is not able to smoke anymore He's not able to drink anymore. He's not able to go to prostitutes anymore. He's not able to do any evil anymore. And now he has started reading Bible, going to church. Some people say, well, that sin is of the devil. What's of the devil? 
You mean the devil is now changing people, turning them away from adultery and fornication? You mean the devil is now turning people away from smoking and drinking? The devil is now uniting families? The devil is now making the lives of somebody beautiful? I'm sure you are wrong. This is of God. This is of God. Lives are changing in a twinkling of an eye, in a just a moment, as they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They are being changed. They are being changed. Well, it took me myself time before I got saved. Started hearing the gospel, hearing the gospel. And it took me about four months before I eventually gave up and, and got saved. But will it take everybody four months or five months or four years or 20 years before they get saved? No. The people that prayed to me, they didn't tell me that I could get saved the first time they saw me. They just encouraged me to keep coming to the church, to keep repenting, to keep making right my ways, to keep praying, to keep crying, and to keep talking to the Lord, and to keep begging the Lord. Be uh, uh, can you ever think about it? Begging the Lord for salvation. Begging the Lord. Who has been waiting for you all these years to get saved? Who has been saying, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and have fellowship with him. Begging the Lord. Can you imagine Jesus Christ saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Begging the Lord. Can you ever imagine whosoever is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. Whosoever is thirsty, let him take the water of life freely. Begging the Lord. That's what he told me, to be begging the Lord before I could get saved. You don't beg the Lord, you just come and you drink the water of life. You don't beg the Lord, you just repent and you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved. And the moment you say, I turn away from all my evil, all my sin, and I believe that Jesus Christ died for me to take all my sins away, that moment you will be saved. That moment you will be saved. If you were not saved before tonight, you can get saved. You can give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ instantaneously. A miraculous change will happen in your heart. Now look at verses 35 to 40. And when it was day in the morning, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison to all this saying to Paul, The magistrates have sent to, to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But... Paul said unto them, They are beating us openly uncondemned, being Romans, and have cast us into prison, and not they thrust us out privately, privily, nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. Have you ever seen a man who doesn't want to get out of prison? Who wants to do some more follow-up, some preaching more? Some sharing of gospel message more. This Paul, when we get to heaven, we need to see this Paul. That they imprisoned you, and for goodness sake, they told you to get out of that prison, and you said you are not ready yet. Let the magistrates themselves come and fetch us out here. You go and tell them, I am a Roman citizen, and they beat me like that publicly. I know my right. I'll show them something. Those people came in verse 38, and the sergeant told these words unto the magistrates, and they feared when they heard that they were Romans, because it was unlawful to condemn or to imprison a Roman citizen without proper trial. And they came and besought them. They pleaded with them and brought them out and desired them to depart out of the city. And when they, when they went out of the prison, they entered into the house of Lydia. They told them to run out of the city. They said, uh, sorry, we can't go out quickly like that. We have some brethren. We still need to go and encourage them. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and they departed. Paul was a wonderful person. He had the spirit of God. He had the power of God. He knew how to behave under every circumstance. In persecution, at the time he was to preach, in the various circumstances of his life, there is much for us to learn. And I believe that the same God that worked with them, with Paul and Silas and the team, that same God is with us today. The same God that helped them in all their trials and all their persecutions and all their oppositions, that same God is with us today. And I believe that if you are going through any trial, any difficulty, any problem, that same God will help you today. That same God will give you a miracle. 
and for us who are real Christians, we must understand that we are called to be soul winners. And as soul winners, watch for every opportunity. Depend upon the Spirit of the Lord to know what to say. Do you know, my brother, my sister, somebody can get saved right in the office during the break? Within the 30 minutes, if you'll just wait upon the Lord and know how to properly communicate the gospel message to that person, within the 30 minutes, somebody can get saved? Do you know that in your right, uh, in your house, at the house fellowship, while you're leading the house fellowship, you can take those people one by one, the people that are not saved because they do not know the way, they do not know how. Do you know that just after the house fellowship, you can sit down with them and lead them to the Lord and get saved? Do you know that while you are traveling, if you are in the plane, somebody by your side, you can witness to that person and just bow your head in quiet prayer and that person can get saved? Do you know that in every place, when there is time and when the people are opening up, you can present the gospel and they do not have to come to the church before they get saved. They can get saved right there and then be led to come to the fellowship of the church. I believe that as we begin to respond, to the call of the soul winner. Many people will be getting saved through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up and pray together. I want you to present yourself to the Lord. Present yourself to the Lord. If you are saved, if you are going through persecution, opposition, criticism, problem, forget the problem. Don't let your problems hinder your prayers. Don't let your feelings decrease your faith. And if you have not been saved, you can get saved right now. If you have not been born again, you can surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 